When the preliminary report for the Hong Kong 747 crash came out, many people, including me, expected clarification. Instead, we got a puzzle. The landing looked normal, the rollout started normally, yet seconds later, a fully loaded Boeing 747 veered off the runway with one engine producing takeoff level thrust. So in this video, we're gonna break down what that new evidence really means, both mechanically and in the cockpit. And more importantly, why investigators still have far more questions than answers. Whenever you analyze a runway excursion, one of the first things you do is step back and ask, what should have happened here? And in this case, the landing setup was about as standard as it gets for a long, dry runway in Hong Kong. The aircraft, an ACT Airlines 747 operating for Emirates, was configured for landing with flaps 25 and auto brake level 2. On a 747, that's a very common setup. Flaps 25 give a stable approach profile, and auto brake 2 provides enough deceleration without making the rollout uncomfortable or overly aggressive. The weather was calm, visibility was excellent, and there were no no-tams or surface hazards. In other words, the autopilot's job was simple, and so was the crew's. Now, an important detail in this case is the aircraft's MEL status. MEL stands for Minimum Equipment List, a document that allows certain non-critical items to be inoperative while still letting the aircraft legally fly. Many four-engine aircraft can dispatch safely with one thrust reverser inoperative because they have plenty of redundancy. In this case, engine number four's thrust reverser was MEL placarded inoperative, which is normally not a safety issue at all. Why? because most 747 crews don't use full reverse on the outboard engines anyway. Engines one and four sit far out along the wings, and full reverse on them can create strong yaw if something becomes asymmetric. So many crews rely primarily on engines two and three, the inboard pair, for strong reverse thrust. That's exactly what this crew did. Reversers two and three went to about 95% N1. Engine 1 stayed at idle reverse, and 4 was expected to provide idle only because its reverser was disabled. That's all normal. After touchdown, the spoilers extended automatically, which is what you want. Spoilers dump, lift, and plant the aircraft firmly on the runway so the wheels can brake effectively. The callouts were reportedly correct, the rollout began smoothly, and the aircraft started to slow. And that is what makes the next part so important. This accident didn't begin with a bad landing. It began with a normal one. The turning point in this incident wasn't the touchdown. It was what happened after the auto brakes disengaged. According to the preliminary report, shortly into the rollout, an auto brakes message popped up on the ICAs. That simply means the automatic system turned itself off, usually because the pilot is transitioning to manual braking. The captain took control, which is exactly what you're trained to do, up to this moment, everything is textbook. Around 10 seconds later, something happened that the report describes in plain, unmistakable terms. Engine number four began producing forward thrust. Not idle thrust, not a slight increase. Forward thrust that climbed toward takeoff power. This is where the entire event pivots from routine to extraordinary. At 3.52.30, engine four reached roughly 90% in one. Five seconds later, all reversers were stowed. And then engine four kept climbing, 106% N1 by 36 seconds, and up to 107% N1 by 42 seconds. On a 747, that is essentially full power. Now imagine that physically. On the left wing, three engines are either in idle or reverse, pulling the aircraft back. On the far right wing tip, engine four is pushing forward with enormous force. That creates a huge asymmetric moment, something no amount of braking can easily overcome at high speed. The aircraft will yaw left sharply, and that's exactly what the data shows. There is an additional layer to this mechanical mystery, the spoilers. According to the preliminary report, the speed brake lever was later found in the flight detent position, the position used during takeoff or go around, not in the fully deployed landing position. Why does that matter? Because on many 747, if any thrust lever is advanced significantly after touchdown, the aircraft's logic automatically retracts the spoilers. The system interprets power advancement as the crew initiating a go around. It's an automatic safeguard, not a fault. So if engine four truly spooled up on its own, 
the airplane may have believed the crew wanted to go flying again, and it tucked the spoilers away. Losing spoiler drag in the middle of a high-speed directional issue makes things even harder to control. But the most significant detail in the entire report is this. The thrust lever for engine 4 was found physically pushed fully forward. That's not a software glitch. That's not a telemetry error. That is a mechanical lever in a mechanical quadrant sitting in the takeoff power position. Meanwhile, engines 1, 2, and 3 were sitting at idle with maximum reverse selected. So we're left with a cockpit picture that looks like this. Three levers pulled back, reverse thrust commanded. One lever, engine four, all the way forward. This raises an obvious question. How could the lever get there, and why didn't anyone see it? To understand why the answer isn't as simple as it seems, we need to look inside the cockpit, not just at the mechanical systems, but at what the humans were experiencing in those seconds. It's tempting to ask, why didn't the crew just pull the engine four lever back? But when you look at the human factors picture, the situation becomes more complicated. In a four engine aircraft, when the pilot selects reverse, the hand normally spans all four thrust levers. Even if a reverser is inoperative as engine four was, your hand still rests on that lever. You pull them all back together to idle, then lift the reverse handles. It's a physical, very tactile action pilots are used to feeling uniform resistance across the levers. But think about what's happening during a sudden, unexpected veer. The captain has just taken control following the auto brake disconnect. The airplane is still fast, still heavy, and is now violently pulling to the left. At that moment, the pilot's attention is outside, fighting to keep the aircraft centered and avoid obstacles. Their eyes aren't scanning the thrust quadrant, they are locked forward, trying to save the airplane. That's not negligence. That's human attention under extreme pressure. The preliminary report says nothing yet about crew conversations or their physical movements because the full CVR and FDR analysis is not complete. We don't know whether the lever moved before the veer began or during it. And we don't know whether the cockpit forces during the excursion could have shifted lever positions after the aircraft left the pavement. We also don't know whether the thrust increase was triggered by human input or by automation. On most aircraft, the thrust lever can advance automatically if a toga button is triggered. That's intentional design go around thrust is commanded for safety. But the report does not say whether such a command was ever registered. So we're left with two broad investigative pathways, both still open. Did the airplane command that thrust or did a human hand? And if it was human, was it intentional accidental, or even noticed? At this stage, the preliminary report does not and cannot answer that question. What we do know is this. The thrust asymmetry created a situation that was almost impossible for the crew to counteract. Once engine four reached takeoff power and the spoilers tucked away, the aircraft's directionally stability was essentially lost. The captain tried to reapply reverse on three engines, but by that point, the aircraft was already leaving the runway surface. And tragically, the 747 struck a security vehicle beyond the runway perimeter, resulting in two fatalities. Our thoughts go out to their families. Loss of life on the ground is a reminder that runway excursions can have consequences far beyond the airplane itself. So why does all of this matter? Because this accident sits at the intersection of aircraft design, pilot workload, and system logic. Investigators now have to determine whether this was a mechanical anomaly a control system input, a human factors event, or some combination of all three. They'll be analyzing cockpit interactions, thrust lever linkages, toga switch behavior, maintenance records, and the flow of actions after auto brakes disconnected. And if the final report explains how that thrust lever moved, the findings could lead to changes in training, checklist, philosophy, or even cockpit ergonomics. This is one of those cases that has the potential to influence safety recommendations for years to come. For now, though, the mystery remains. Engine four produced full forward thrust during rollout. The thrust lever itself was found fully forward, and the sequence that led to that moment is still unknown. As more evidence comes out, especially from the CVR and FDR, we'll continue to follow it closely and bring you clear, fact-based updates. This case is far from closed, and the final report will likely be one of the most closely studied in recent years. 
Thanks for watching, and as always, fly safe.